Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. We are Dumb Money. Welcome to Dumb Money Live. It uh, it feels like so long since we've said that. Um, if you're wondering just how long it is, uh, it has been four weeks. That's that's actually not as much as, as I thought. Uh, I know we did miss a lot this summer. Today we're going to try to catch you up, maybe do a little portfolio reveal, tell you the only way that we like to trade in markets like this. But for the record, I'm actually impressed that we were able to do seven whole shows this summer, despite me being on vacation since uh, May 11th. That, I just got back this week. Um, since our last live stream, the S&P 500 down about 10%. And so this is very important, guys. We can get the market to go back up by doing one simple thing, smashing the like button. Chris Jordan, uh, I actually do think there is some correlation between the like button and the S&P because when we're on, it seems to go up. And when we're not, we just, the market tanks. Dude, Dave's we vacation a good is summer. bad for stocks. We picked a good summer to take off. I mean, but Dave takes off every summer now, but I feel like- This was this a, an thing. extended, like last summer, I summered in the Northeast. This, this was pretty much- I was I came back for about two weeks, and in part of that went on vacation with Chris to Florida, and then went back. <laughs> it was um, it was it was fun though. I mean, I had a great time. I enjoy being places for extended periods, and really just feeling like it's a it's not. It, it feels like it wasn't a vacation anymore. It feels like that's just a new way of life. Um. I can't imagine that because I just like to hang out in my house or in, in the closet here and just do nothing. That's my that's my dream life is doing nothing. Where Your dream life is out exploring the world. We're very different people. And do you know um, how hard it is to like turn off the stock market? I mean, eventually you get kind of used to it. And especially when there's like no Internet in some of the places I was. Um, but the last time we did a show four weeks ago, we were in the middle of a little market rally. Uh, and during that, from low to high, uh, the market went up 18% since mid-June. So I want to talk a little about that. I want to talk about timing the market because, Chris, I know you had some mm -hmm. examples of how not to time the market this uh, summer. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be interesting to talk about. Uh Dave, we also need to talk about how to, and we've mentioned this a few times this year, how to actually execute on a social ARB observational investing strategy in a volatile market like this, where the macro tends to be defining the day-to-day -day moves, not information related to one particular sector or yeah. stock. It, we'll talk about that as well. I think that's probably the most meaningful thing that can come out of today's episode is how do we as individual investors figure out how to find and execute uh, trades uh, on alpha that we believe we have in this crazy market? There, It is possible. I'm going to talk about one massive success story that I had this last month <clears throat> that I want to try to replicate once or twice more before the end of this year. And I am working on another big social arb trade that I hope to do this on. So yeah, yeah I want to hear what that it. trade is. I want to hear the trade that worked out for you. And I also think it, it just out of transparency, you should talk about how you uh, didn't time the market so well, because I think that you, you were telling me that story. And I think that that was yep. probably a better learning experience than, you know, the one that did happen to work out. Although the way that the strategy behind the one that did work, I think is something that we should put into play for everything, especially when there's crazy macro stuff going on. Um, and then, I mean, you, you talk about macro stuff, but then there's also like the FedEx story. And I want to talk about that a little bit too, because the headlines- That's macro today, driven though. That's macro driven too. Well, well, well FedEx I mean, maybe, right? So partially macro and partially that FedEx is a terrible company. I swear they drop kick packages onto my front porch every time they come by. Uh, Jordan, you Not think they're terrible? I just paid $600 to UPS an ice cream uh, push cart to New York that I found here in Texas. And UPS damaged it. It's basically broken. And it got it arrived a week late. So I said, it arrived a week late. I want my money back on the delivery fees. And they said, oh, we stopped doing that during COVID. 
and never picked it back up again when it comes to ground packages. So your ground packages do not have to arrive on time. They could arrive three months later and you're still paying 600 bucks in this case to get it delivered three months late. I did buy insurance. The insurance process, they said, could take up to two months for them to <laughs> basically go through with the claim. I'm so pissed. Oh, really? They don't just like pay on those things? Like if something goes wrong? Nope. Nope, they don't. Wow. It's already taken hours of my time. Anyway, can I just say, okay, what, what have we been saying all year? I think this is really important as a baseline. Do less, understand what you don't know, understand what you're incapable of predicting or trading, which is the macro market. I'm sure somewhere out there, there's a human being somewhere in the world that can trade the macro market efficiently. If they are, and they're not a billionaire, something's wrong because if you could a accurately predict the macro market even for any amount of time with any sort of reasonable accuracy you should become a billionaire very quickly right because there's infinite liquidity infinite leverage um so i really don't believe anyone that says they're capable of timing macro markets i know i can't um but dave i have been shorting or hedging my portfolio all year and my short hedge has ranged between 30% and 80%. And I recently, in the last few weeks, moved it back up to 80%. Today, I want to say I'm, I'm up to almost 90% hedged today on my account. And that's simply by shorting the SPY, shorting the QQQ, <clears throat> and at times shorting a couple other ETFs that are more focused on consumer discretionary and retail. So it's not, an, it's not a perfect hedge but it pretty much hedges my portfolio more or less. And yeah. my was, gut was instinct never, on when- at no point this summer was I 80% hedged. I, I was probably closer to 20%. And it was, I, I wouldn't say it was t trying to time the market. I would say it was more momentum based as the market was going down. I would just kind of throw a partial hedge on. And when it looked like it was going back up, I would take that back off. And I did the math and, um, uh, right now, the market is down about 8% since the beginning of summer when I did my whole sale in May and go away, which uh, for perspective, that was, uh, that was what? We're back right where we were in March of 2021. So we've basically seen kind of undoing all these unrealized gains, but um, market is down 8%. My portfolio is bound down about 2.5% until today where it looks like it's down another 2%. So like I basically stayed even during a very volatile and down market, which was which is exactly what I wanted to do. Well, I, I every time I try to time the market based on just my gut instinct in a meaningful way, it usually goes bad. And I that happened to me last week. Uh, last week, even though I was already 70 plus percent hedged. I decided to buy puts on the market because I just didn't believe this narrative that was popping up that inflation was going to settle uh, anytime in the immediate future based on just what I was seeing. I was like, I think the market's wrong. But where I made my mistake is I, I didn't, <laughs> I bought puts that only lasted like nine days. So my puts expired last Friday. I, I guess I put the trade on the board or something. And uh, I lost $125,000 on those puts. And then the market this week <laughs> took a dump. I would have made so much money if I would have just had those puts expired <clears throat> this Friday, today, as opposed to last Friday. And it just it's just kind of like the constant kick in the butt reminder that, Chris, you know you can't do that. You know you can't time it. Stop trying to do it. I'm so good not doing that. And then I just, I'll tell you the reason why I did it, I think. And this is my other big word of caution that I've always preached. You usually make your worst decisions after a huge trade. And I had a huge trade go right uh, just a couple, a few weeks ago. Uh, for those of you all that have been watching sporadically our episodes this summer, our last episode was about Lululemon. And I actually put a tweet out the day of earnings, before earnings, or the day before earnings, or the morning before earnings. And I essentially posted a Jeffries um, 
a Jeffrey's report that was a huge short report on Lulu predicted them to go down to $200 a share. They were concerned about consumer demand, concerned about all kinds of stuff. And I said, I just, I just flat out disagree with this. I'm, I'm going long, man. I'm going long. I'm going long big into earnings. If you watch that show, we talked about Bama Rush on TikTok, but we also talked about the crossbody bag. Uh, that has been just crushing it all summer. We also talked about Lulu's ability to completely infiltrate younger millennials and Gen Z in a way that I've never seen them make this move in Gen Z before. With the work they're doing at college campuses, it's just staggering how cool that brand has become, uh, even more so with a really young generation. So they're kind of replicating the success they had uh, with kind of older millennials to baby boomers with Lulu, and they're crushing it with the kids now. That all came out in this earnings report. As anyone that watched it knows, Lulu just completely crushed earnings. They beat and raised like I knew they would. Uh, here's what I learned from that trade. When you're trading social ARB in a volatile macro market, you cannot afford to put a trade on a day early or two days early because the market might yeah, completely the market dump, is just like which is it has a mind of its own and it will affect yeah. whatever it is that you're trying to play bigger than the actual like social edge that you think you have yeah so i waited i waited until the day of earnings or i think it was the day of earnings or the day before earnings i don't remember what but i, I essentially bought my calls very close to the actual earnings itself. Uh, I think I spent about $90,000 on call options, roughly $100,000 on call options. And I sold those options, I think for $370,000 um, within with less than 24 hours later. So it was like a 16 hour trade or 17 hour trade. And I, you know, I booked a quarter of a million on that trade. Obviously it, I got too cocky. And then I wanted to try to time the overall market, which is not what I do. That is not what I do. And and I lost a hundred k of it, a hundred, you know, more than that. Even I think I lost like one hundred twenty five k, roughly half the money that I made. I immediately lost on an idiotic macro, uh, just stupid trade. Really short term. I just think you have to give yourself time with options right now. And so if you're buying stuff a week or two weeks out. I, I'm not doing that. The shortest duration that I'm buying on puts is like 45 days out. And um, I, I didn't do any options at all this summer. I was yeah. doing straight shorts on very large indexes that were very yeah. close to um, my account. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I, I ended up losing money in one. So I had to switch to another so I, could, I wouldn't have a uh, wash sale on that one. So right. I had to find another one that was also fairly close. Um, but, you know, the, the um, spy and the cues are good, good ways for me to try to mirror my portfolio because I did this math today too. 88% of my portfolio are my top three holdings. Apple, Tesla, I think that's, Amazon. I think that's fine, Dave. The, the outlook that I have coming out of today's episode is very simple. I'm not going to mess too much with the market here. I'm going to keep my portfolio hedged, again, somewhere between 30 and 90%, depending upon how I feel at that moment in time. Um, I am going to focus on trying to get one or two more big social arb trades out between now and the end of the year, if they come. Uh, I'm working on one. I'm not going to reveal it today because earnings are not for another three or four weeks. And we'll, we'll probably I will have one more show I, between well, now and then. Oh my God, Dave, we're going to have we're going to have a lot more shows than that. But but no. I will. Pr I promise. Here's the thing. I promise. The second I make this trade, I promise to reveal it through this show and or Twitter and or our Discord channel, dumbmoney.tv forward slash Discord. I will reveal it with, with my methodology um, and with my trade thesis because I'm going to want the community's reaction the same way I did with Lululemon, the same way we did with On Running, which did not work out well for, I think, again, macro reasons. Uh, the same that we did with Crocs, which was my other insane killer trade of the year. So the Crocs saved my whole year. 
Uh, Lulu was nice, a nice bump on top of that. I think this other trade has potential to be like another Lulu uh, this fall, but I'm yeah. not even going to think about touching that trade right now in this market. I'm going to wait till like 24 hours before earnings to do it, and then I'll reveal it. We'll do our show, and we'll we'll just do as as much debate as we can about this. But guys, I don't want to hold anything any longer than I have to in this market. I really yeah. don't. But that's what I want to hear more about, because you're not going to reveal this trade that you're thinking about maybe doing at some point weeks from now. What I want to hear is what you're doing between now and then to protect your portfolio. Are you are you like nervous about do you think the market's going down another 20 percent? Do you think we're going to kind of I, stay where we are? OK, so, Dave, I think I think there's this looming, there's multiple looming concerns out there. And if any of these looming concerns tend to resolve themselves, they would be huge positives for the market. At the same time, they're looming concerns for a reason. And if they don't resolve themselves, they will continue to be a net negative on this market. So the biggest I would say right now, even above are the, you know, the obvious inflation that we're looking at here in the U.S. is Europe. Um, we have no idea how the situation is going to unfold with energy in Europe, with what Russia is doing. Um, the, Russia knows that it has a very limited window of time to really squeeze Europe going into the winter months. Uh, it could be catastrophic. I think it's an anomaly. I don't think we understand how to size this energy crisis in Europe, the repercussions that it will have uh, in economies and sectors across Europe. Uh, the the degree that that will uh, basically force European governments to essentially try to save their economies uh, by, you know, printing more dollars over there. Right. And then the extent that that will mess with our economy here and just global trade in general, there are so many questions, so much uncertainty around that Europe mess with energy that honestly, like, it just scares the hell out of me. That said, if it doesn't fall apart over the next <clears throat> three to six months, I think it will be fantastic for the market because everyone's worried about what that might look like. There's other well, stuff. Here's, here's what we know, here right? And so we know that uh, energy costs are like, you know, just a shade under an order of magnitude <laughs> higher than they have been in the past, right? So six, seven times. Um, now, the in the UK, they're going to cap people's... Um, energy expenditures at like 2,500 pounds, which is still like three times higher than they're used to spending. So no matter what, the consumer's getting squeezed. So anybody that's got like major European exposure, like that's why I'd be concerned about like an Apple or somebody like that. Like they're not selling excess iPhones and iPads this year in Europe because uh, people are spending all their money on energy bills. Um, you got the highest inflation. Yeah, I mean, I love it, but uh, I don't, don't think they're gonna sell quite as many in Europe as they would on a normal yeah. year. So how did, what does that make you feel like? How do you think that impacts our market over the next few between now and the end of the year, Jordan? Are you you think there's more downside risk or upside risk of, of oh, being I think too over way more downside risk? And so I think, um, you know, I think we're going to see earnings drop over the next, you know, six, nine, 12 months. And um You've got rates high. Um, people can go to bonds. I just don't think that the market is a really good place for people to be right now. The stock market in well, general. Longer -term investor, you can like hide out, but what's that? If you're a longer term investor, like I think all of us are, um, this is an opportunity that we're seeing stocks super low. I mean, I don't like FedEx as a company, but when it's 20 percent off, it's like, oh, well, they're they're going to survive. Right. Uh I think that the I think Jim Cramer put the word worldwide recession into his mouth. He wasn't going to he wasn't he wasn't making that prediction. But when pushed and I have the clip, if you want to watch it, no, there there is a there is an there is a recession going on across the entire world. Right. And so there's there's going to be an earnings recession across, you know, Europe, Asia and the United States. But how um, much of that is already South priced America. in? What's that? How much of that is already priced in? So typically, like, you know, miles. So like if you look at the like the 2000 um, crash, that was a mild recession. Right. And so that was a, you know, 45, 50 percent drop in stock prices. If you look at the Great Recession, 
Um, that actually wasn't that big of a recession. I mean, it was good size. I mean, there was there were pockets, especially housing, that were hit really hard, but you know, it wasn't that bad. And you're talking fifty something percent off the S and P. And so I don't think it's unreasonable. Now we're twenty percent ish down, not quite right now. Could we see another 15, 20? I think that's in the cards, right? And so are we going to get to 50? Depends if it's shallow, if it's bigger. It depends on how much earnings go down. Um, and I, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of downside risk right now. I think, but don't, you know, all this conversation, I know that everyone's having the same conversation we're having right now. And I think it's just, listen, we're having it, but I think it's stupid. I think it's stupid for us to think that we could outthink the institutional global money flows as it relates to how they perceive market risk and when they choose to kind of come back into the market a little longer or take some off the table, which moves the market lower. It, it, that's just not a game I want to play. I mean, even if you're right, like I was right, I was right a week early, right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't, I just, I think yeah, everybody so I mean, needs thing to you have- can't argue with though is that the consumer's getting squeezed. We've got um, credit card, um, debt at the, you know, climbing a really high clip right now. Um, savings are getting obliterated. The consumer doesn't have any extra money. Now, that may be that like the average viewer here, but the average person in the United States, and especially in Europe, uh, is getting squeezed pretty hard, right? And so they've got less discretionary income. We know that industry is slowing down. You've got higher input prices um, to pretty much all manufacturing um uh, with some of the higher energy prices. So I, I just don't see but, but how much of it, that right? is and now you're starting to see layoffs, right? And so the other thing you've got is inflation, right? And so um, you battle all these things. And so the Fed right now is just focused clearly on inflation. And if they keep raising rates, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean okay. for um, the consumer? They're not going to be buying cars. They're not going to be buying houses or, you know. They're... And we know the Fed has one job and that to, is to, save face and get inflation down to 2%. And it's really painful to get down to well, 2%. They've got to do it, man. Uh, we may or may not be back on the same stream. We may be on a new stream. If you're just joining us, um, there's something going on in my internet after uh, being out of town. There's something on my network that uh, decides to take the whole internet down. Jordan, we're waiting for Jordan. There's Jordan. I don't know. I don't know if we're even streaming right now. I I hope so. Yeah, it's on. We're we on are. YouTube. We're are we on YouTube. the same channel? On the same video? Yeah. Yeah. Same video. <laughs> oh. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Yeah, that's, we're uh, back. Okay. That's great. All right. So I, there's something I have to say to Jordan though. Jordan, everything you just said is correct. Right. What I'm getting at is it's also widely known. I mean, yeah, but it's so you like say... you don't just so just because it's known doesn't mean that the we're going back up, right? That the market's going I, back up. I and agree. So, you know, I, I don't think that that's a, a good way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people talk about this. I think it is widely known, um, but it's, you know, moving stock prices around is a process that takes months, not days. I uh, agree, and which is why I also agree with you, Jordan. I would say there's more risk on the downside than on the upside between now and the end of the year. That said, I'm just going to keep doing what I've been doing, which is completely ignore the market for the most part. Yes, there are times I'm going to move my hedge down. I'm going to move it up. But for the most part, I'm not super exposed to the market, probably between now and the end of the year. Who knows? That might change. But also, what are the triggers what I want that, decide, do, that make you decide to hedge more or less? Um, it, it just, Dave, I think it's... Is it a feeling? I are think you trying to time the market? It, it, it's an idiotic feeling that, that might or might not be right. It just... I don't know. I can't really answer that. It's based on things that I'm seeing in the market that are more worrisome. Um, like Jordan, like based on what I'm feeling that week, based on every all my inputs, right? But I don't want to get into that, Dave, because that's not what I do. I, I'm going to assume that I'm going to do a bad job at that. And it doesn't really yeah. matter. Historically, because... everybody has done a bad job at that. <laughs> and so it's really difficult. Yes. And that's why I'm just like, so, why are you even messing with it? Why are you why are you ratcheting up your hedge and ratcheting it down? Because you know you're I probably shouldn't. going to be worse Dave, off I than should. if you just kept in your stocks. I shouldn't, which is why I don't even really want to talk about that. Because like, no, it's not what I'm good at. I, by the way, if anyone watching the show should basically ignore all that stuff that I say, by the way, we're not financial advisors. This is just you what should the hell ignore everything you say anyway. 
So don't don't mirror anything we're saying. But what I do want to say is that everybody is so focused on the macro. And when I say, when I mean everybody, I mean institutional money managers. Everybody is focused on the macro. What does that mean? That means there's more opportunity than there's ever been to identify equity related opportunities, right? Do that that observational investing, things that we're seeing, brands that are still exploding regardless of what's happening in the world with the economy. Lululemon is going through such a hype cycle that it really didn't matter what was happening, right, with inflation or anything else, because it just meant that they were going to do a little bit less insanely good than they would have without that situation, right? That will continue to be an opportunity for us as individual investors. The key is that I can't put a trade on a company that I think is going to have a blowout earnings until the day before earnings. Because if the market drops 10% between now and next month, I'm still down 10%, right? Especially if I'm trading options, which I did with Lulu, right? I could be zeroed out before I even get to earnings. So I'm going to continue to wait until the very last moment. And then I'm going to put my trade on if I see another Lulu type of situation or a Croc situation or even on running, which again, on running beat and raised, okay? And the stock still ultimately fell a little bit um, due to the overall market. On running as a company, I cannot wait to trade them next quarter. If they continue to keep the momentum that I'm seeing in the consumer data, okay, if they continue to keep that momentum between now and next earnings report, I cannot wait to trade them. Same thing with Crocs, okay? Same thing with Lulu more than anyone else. I think Lulu, I really, part of me hopes the market just gets rocked in the next few weeks just so it will bring Lulu back down because I don't think Lulu is going to feel any of this. I think they're going to still have a spectacular quarter based on everything that I'm seeing right now. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, their inventories are still up, right? And so, you know, again, like they're trying to do a big open in Europe right now. I think they just opened a bunch of stores in Spain. How is the Europe, you know, how is the European consumer going to absorb, you know, $150 yoga pants um, when they're paying? Jordan, I... Out their ears on electricity. Uh, Okay, maybe a little bit less than they would have in a different situation. But if they still are getting a much larger share of wallet, which I think is exactly what's happening right now, they're getting a huge share of wallet. Um, The the consumers that can't afford it, and Jordan, you know better than anyone, if you're in the top one, two, three percent, you're not concerned about spending $150 on Lululemon, it's not they, stopping anybody. They are okay? such a differentiated brand. Yeah, but that's not their, that's not their only consumer, Chris. Like they it, they they don't just sell to the top one percent. They sell to, you know, mildly no, they, affluent. And you you know you know about this more than anybody. And the they, pe- the people that buy Lululemon persons are not the one percent, Chris. They don't. They do not need everybody buying their product. They just need a larger share of wallet to make up for the lower wallet in general, right? So if the lower, if everybody's wallets get cut by 10% and their share of wallet amongst that type of product goes up by 20%, they're in really good shape. But their I agree, it would have been they better. Have, they have a lot of inventory. They've ramped up for this high demand that they've been seeing uh, in places like China where all of the other athleisure brands have been on the decline they came in huge they did great sales there but what if that flips okay i still i'm gonna say that lulu is affordable luxury okay there's a lot of things that you could say i'm gonna spend less money on spending an extra 70 bucks on the lulu thing versus 70 dollars less on the nut it's affordable luxury for a lot of people even when things are not going awesome right with their portfolios it's not really impacting people that want like i i felt listen i don't care i'm just going to look at the data the data is going to show it one way or the other right and i agree jordan europe is a little bit difficult to see the data in europe with a company like Lou. it's a little bit harder than it is here in the us with my data sources but 
you can still see it. And as long as they continue to put out great product, uh, great colorways, as long as they continue to excite people, that crossbody bag, they made a larger version of it into the fall. People tend to love the larger version. So it's like they're still selling out every crossbody bag they're able to manufacture. Um, it's still hype right now. I'm going to just look at the data. And if the data still looks strong between now and, I don't know, was it like 10 weeks from now, 9, 10 weeks, their next earnings? I will lay into that earnings play probably three to five times bigger than I did this quarter. So we'll just wait and see. All yeah, I'm and, saying, and I guys, think that that's is the I'm... interesting thing is we're in a very unique time where the macro is <clears throat> not looking great. There could be s certain things that happen like, you know, in Ukraine that if things flip, the market could come roaring back. But there's such high inflation and everyone's trying to squash the inflation. But the thing is, if things flip in Ukraine, I don't think that really solves anything. It's not like all of a sudden we're going to be like, yeah, we're going to buy all the natural gas in the world from Russia. Like, I just don't think that's going to happen. So I don't think that's like a... That's like a I think so it's... I and think it closes one of those stories in people's minds that they're worried about right now. There is there is a long there is a thesis that says that in the next sixty days, um, Putin is positioning himself, and the rest of the world is potentially, if a deal were to get done, it would likely get done in the next sixty to ninety days, to where everybody would be looking to save face essentially bring Putin back to where he was before. Um, he gets a safe face. He probably ends up getting what he wanted anyway, creating this huge mess. You know how politics go. They'll make it look like we're punishing him, even though ultimately he wins. And there's a pretty reasonable chance that that could happen in the next 60 to 90 days. And if it does, just the relief of opening up those energy markets would just absolutely be a huge positive for global markets and Europe and would spill over into everything. So if it even looks like that deal might start to happen, if they even start to meet on that, I think that could be a positive for the market. I'm not betting on it, but it's a thesis that we have to be aware of as investors if you care about the macro, which I'm trying not to care about the macro. What I'm saying, guys, is with the market coming down, it's taking down everything. Yeah. It's taking down Lulu. It's taking down on running. It's taking down companies that might be doing so well that even in this environment, they're still going to completely crush, unexpectedly crush expectations. I'm not saying they are, but they might. And I think that's where the best opportunity is between now and the end of the year to identify stocks that are actually long thesis stocks wait to the very last second to play them because the market is going to be so negative. It's not going to assume that these anomaly companies can still pull out insanely good quarters where they beat and raise meaningfully. And I think those are probably the best opportunities between now and the end of the year. But I don't think there will be a lot of them. I think maybe one or two or three. And my goal is to find one, you know, find at least one, hopefully two. If I could find three, I'd just be ecstatic between now and December. And I think that exactly what you're saying is is the way I'm going to be playing it too. Because if you look, there are opportunities. If you look at this Lulu chart from the date that the earnings came out, they just they just took off. Now they don't, they had a nosedive going into earnings, and that was an opportunity. It is. I, I still feel like the market is completely ignoring what's happening and on running. I'm keeping a really close eye on it. Um, that's certainly a company that if they beat and guide again, yeah, they beat I can't and imagine. Just so but let's just say this. On running is a company that came out of the gate really strong last year uh, when they IPO'd. They're valued. You know, they, they have you know, it's a high valuation, right? I think there are shareholders in on running that are legacy shareholders that continue to lower their positions and use these liquidity events when they're beating and raising to kind of use them as exit liquidity. I think that's what happened in this quarter. I feel to an extent it's what happened last quarter. At some point that kind of runs out with something like on running. So 
I think if they crush again this quarter, it's a super interesting trade for me. I'm going to be laser focused on them. I'm still monitoring their data weekly. Right now, it looks phenomenal, phenomenal this quarter. I'm not going to trade them yet. I don't want to own them right now. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till we get a lot closer to earnings because I just don't trust the market. What do you think about housing, guys? Uh, Josh, I think Pitts. housing is a huge housing's a disaster. And so until until the you know the Fed chills out um, and brings rates back down, I don't. I just don't think. Who'd want to rush out and spend six and a half percent on a thirty-year mortgage? Um, There's yeah. You're talking like I, I think I saw that like over the course of so over a thirty-year mortgage, a half million dollar house translates to something like three hundred thousand dollars more in uh, borrowing costs in interest payments have you guys seen um what meet kevin is doing with his new startup house you know, I'm, I'm helping him i'm helping him a, li a little bit uh really? with it yeah so well i just like just seeing if i can make some introductions for him i'm just i i think I think it's a really interesting concept. So he has this thesis that the housing market is going to come down quite a bit over the next yeah. six months, six, nine months. Right. And he essentially wants to amass a fund. Uh, he thinks he has a great model. I'm not saying he doesn't. I think he has a really interesting model for identifying homes that are great renters. He has a system in place. He's bringing technology into it. And he essentially wants to build like a mini invitation homes where he's acquiring real estate, like Vulture acquire real estate. When the market comes down, he wants to have his money ready to go. He wants to acquire that real estate and select markets and, you know, fix them up, rent them out, nothing crazy. Uh, he wants to do it to where anybody can invest in it. I think it's actually super interesting. But he, I, I think he thinks the market's going to fall quite a bit as well over the next few I think months. he's like in the top one to two percent of people that do that and so if anybody's gonna put something together like that it, you know it might as well be him because he he knows that space really well well he, he he told me kind of his system um i won't reveal it here i don't know if he's revealed it for his company yeah. but it's actually pretty novel and he has a really interesting take on you know how to identify those homes and quickly get them up to speed and i yeah, I, my I think thought is, yeah, i think that. i think that if you could have invested alongside him when he was doing it on a smaller scale that's amazing but i'm wondering how that how well that scales do you know much about how how he's going to be able to find at volume mm -hmm. i mean he's he's going to have raised so much more money have have to do so many more houses in that kind of buy fix and flip model it's not like he's raising a billion dollar fund so like yeah. i think it'll be manageable for him i just think you're doing it probably with a guy that cares and probably has a little bit like whenever you do a deal like that like investing in someone else to do that model i always think they're they're looking at ways to screw me right like always like all these real estate guys the one thing you can say i mean for those of us that got to know kevin a little bit over the past few years like behind the scenes he's a guy that like really wants to do the right thing for like his investors, right? So like, yeah. I, I think that in itself, like he's so out there with his reputation, his brand for you either love him or hate him, but he wants to protect his reputation and brand, do the right thing. So like, I think he's a guy that's gonna work 18, 19 hours a day for the next seven years to make this deal work, right? Yeah. And, and, and make right it now it is limited to accredited investors. I've downloaded the forms, I'm considering it. Are you, are you going to invest, Chris? I, I, I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know. Because I think of it but the same I, way I you do. Him. I mean, we have invested in so many random startups based purely on the person behind it. And they're, you know, just knowing that they're going to be driven to make it a success. Uh, yeah. are, I mean, to me, that would be the reason to do it. So here's my question. So the shares, he's talking about uh, founders shares. Like, I don't want founder shares. I want preferreds. Right, I don't know. I, I I haven't I haven't read the full. I haven't looked to see what founder shares but he's, means. But he's, that's what he advertises. He says that you're investing alongside him at the same valuation. That, yeah, but that's not. I don't want that. I want preferred. You know what I mean? I want uh, for, fu for future. Right? That's the only way I invest in deals. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, but th th so this is this is set up differently, right? It's set up as on yeah. the real estate side. It's just it's a little bit. 
just a little bit different how they're they set up these deals. I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not spending. I don't know. I, I haven't spent enough time to analyze the investment piece of it. I just think he has a really good model on the operations side. Um, listen, I don't like homes the next six to nine months. I don't like it at all. Like, I think they're going to fall, but so does he. Like, he's not going to acquire homes until they fall, right? I think that's. I well, do think we'll have look, a rebound. If you if you want to be hands off, but you still want to get into the real estate market. I don't like, why wouldn't you do that? Right. Cause he's, he's not going to buy at the top or like on the way down. He's going to, he's going to figure out the exact perfect time to buy. It's not going to be per Nothing's perfect. Right. But yeah, he's, he can't time the market, but right. he's going to be in the right place with a war chest of money a, right. as the housing and market is just falling apart. what factors to look for and when the turnaround is going to come and when people yeah. are going to be the most desperate to sell and what properties are the best ones to buy. So. So, so someone just said his his followers, his prime followers, have lost a lot of money on his stock picks this year. I mean, I don't, I don't follow his, I don't really follow anybody. As you guys know, I, I don't follow anybody's stock picks. Is, so I have the, no idea. This past year has been the toughest market to make money in the stock market, and so you know, I don't think you can blame Kevin if you look. If if you're just if you're just listening to him and buying what he says to buy, it's called doing, your own doing it right. Like, you yeah. know what I mean, <laughs> dude. You know, the, the best thing, I think the best thing for people that watch YouTube, watch other investors is ideation. That's it. Like if, if someone, yeah. if you hear somebody say something or if you read an article or you're listening to an investor, it's like if you're listening to us, anything like all it is, is just like, wait, I heard Chris talk about Lulu or on running or Crocs. OK, great. Now let me go do my own research and see if yeah. Chris is an idiot or if well, he's figure missing out something own, or if he's on figure out your own process what's your time horizon I, are you trying to flip something in a couple days or you know i, I just don't there's too many questions well, to answer before you can just listen to somebody and say yep i'm gonna buy that stock well, well but jordan we always approach our investments as we have a thesis yeah this is the thesis we're gonna test that thesis we invite other people to test our thesis to see if it's right or wrong, or if there are other factors that override our thesis that are more meaningful to that company this quarter yeah. than our thesis, our piece of information. And then we invite people to share their, their research with us. And then collectively, hopefully we can all make our own decisions and we make better decisions as a community, as a dumb money <clears throat> community, than we would alone. And hopefully there are people in our community that are surfacing social ARB or observational investing type of opportunities and other people are helping with the research. Man, that's what it's all about. I, I've said it, I'll say it again. I think approximately 50% of my big investments the last two to three years were helped by this community, whether I found them through the community or the community helped me research them and make a better decision. Like I kind of owe 50% of my made money the last few years to the dumb money community. And I, I think that if anyone's doing this right, they should be able to say the same thing. I only found that because a guy or a girl in the community mentioned something. We don't always agree. How, how many yeah. times do we disagree just amongst us three? on a trade that one of us every time <laughs> yeah, right 100 yes. of the time <laughs> i mean jordan all right jordan all right before the uh, let's tell people before lululemon earnings how much time did me and you spend on the phone in the 24 hours before that earnings call and i was trying to convince like i was i told you i was like hey here's my thesis i really want you to look yeah. into it. you ultimately made your own decision and i still feel like my decision was the right decision which was not taking a position um, I do actually own a little bit of Lulu, just but, yeah. you know, just like I've had it forever, and uh, but I wasn't going to take a, a off a big chunk just because of the inventory situation, right? I didn't see that getting better. Um, I know the state of the consumer. Did I think they were probably going to have a really good quarter? Yeah, but I think the question is the guide, right? And so, are they right on the guide or not? And we'll find out. You know, we'll find out in a few months. Um, by the way, uh, people just made a comment saying uh, Kevin's the next future Grant Cardone. There's a lot of stuff going on right now about I Grant Cardone. I don't like the saying that because I'm not a big Grant Cardone fan. And I think Kevin no, is no, genuine. not at all. I, the whole, you the whole seen? guru world, I, I can't nope. stand those types of people. And yeah. I think that no, Kevin Dave. actually is different because he actually was operating these businesses. And yes, he does sell a lot of courses. He spends a lot of time selling things to YouTube watchers. But, but here's the thing, he's working his tail off putting together 
information yeah. and he's very thoughtful. And if he didn't think that he could provide value, I don't think he would be doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, listen, uh, by the way, just on that whole thing, first of all, like, like I said, the reason why we're even talking about me, Kevin, is yeah. he, he is a person that behind the scenes I've gotten to know. Um, and I would say my gut instinct is he, he might make or lose people money, but I think his heart is in the right place. I, right. I can't necessarily say that or is true or not about a guy like Grant Cardone. Um, but here's the thing. There's a YouTube video that came out a few weeks ago on Grant Cardone. It was insane. It was a, by a guy that essentially he, he works with Wall Street firms and he helps them kind of look for fraud. And he claims, based on his research, that for like, a I don't know, a one or two year period that he researched Grant Cardone's investments in big real estate transactions, tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars, that on every single transaction, this is what he claims, Grant Cardone purchased the transaction for himself mar and then marked it up and sold it to the Grant Cardone fund entity mm. for millions of dollars more each transaction yeah. and according to this youtuber i don't know his name i don't have it here handy grant cardone made like a hundred million dollars by basically self-dealing i don't know whether that was disclosed or not disclosed to yeah. his investors but that is that that is what this person is claiming i haven't done the research i don't know if it's true or not but that was a bombshell and he also claims that grant cardone is getting investigated for this, like, watch out. The next 12 months, 12 to 18 months should be really interesting to see if Cardone actually does get it. I mean, if that's true, if that's actually true, and he bought properties for like 20 million and then immediately sold them to his fund for 24 million, I can't even imagine the ethics involved in that the legalities forget about legalities the ethics if that's actually true yeah it's definitely not ethical um, i don't know i don't know specifically what the law is around self-dealing like that yeah. um i can't imagine it's permissible but you know who knows i it's it's it sounds it's super wild. illegal <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound good if it's true <laughs> that will never happen on dumb money that i can guarantee you guys well, we yeah, might be guarantee right that because we never sell anything but we are never trying to make money. I, I, I don't want to say I've never tried. I actually am trying to make money off our community. I'm trying to make money off of our community's ideas and research, like I said. Like, right. please continue. I'm, I love the DMs that people send me when they, they really are on to something big. And I always promise. I'm like, hey, if somebody sends me something and they're like, dude, I found in, in Discord or anywhere, I will do my best to research it and share it back with them before I share it with the community. It's like, hey, here's what I found good, bad, ugly. I love it, man. I swear to you every single day, guys, I still wake up thinking today is the day that I'm going to find the next big thing, the next big trade. I still feel that way. At my age, I am more excited today to find the next big trade than I ever have because finally the market is starting to settle to where you have companies that if they do crush it, could have massive moves, right? So like, they're out there. Could, I will say this, guaranteed, in the next 12 months, there will be at least three to five monster social arb trades. These are trades that are related to products or brands or a shift in culture or something really meaningful that has changed in the world that is impacting a publicly traded company where the market just didn't see it yet. They're like a couple weeks late or a month late or a day late. Those trades are out there. They will happen in the next 12 months. Are we going to find them? That's the only question. Can we find them a little bit early? And when you find them, how much money are you willing to throw into that, right, from a risk perspective? Because I, right now, when I look back at the research I did on Lululemon and Jordan, how confident was I on the phone calls with you going to that Lulu trade? What's I was yeah, like, you were we were one hundred percent confident. I almost did it just because of how confident you were, but ultimately it's my decision, so I made my own decision. That's was right. It a good decision. I think it was, even though it wasn't the money making decision. But but the thing is, like, I was so concerned about the market that in the back of my head, because I got screwed with the on running trade, kind of right. I was like, do I really want to risk? 
half a million dollars in an options trade if Lulu beats and raises just like on running did, but then the market that morning is down 500 points right? and Lulu is flat or down a dollar or like mm. up $3, but it's not enough to like keep any value in my options. And I lo just lost half a million. I wasn't comfortable losing half a million dollars but like, God, I wish I would have done it because I would have made 1.3 million, right, in 18 hours. And that's what I need this. That's what I need right now. I need that kind <laughs> of a trade this year. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think so we all like, need that. But I want to go bigger. I do want to go bigger in the next one, guys. And this one I'm working on right now. I'm not as confident as I was about Lulu yet, but there's a lot of time left between. In fact, I did a store visit and I, I did some interviews this week and kind of my thesis is kind of coming together on it. So continue to watch Dumb Money. Hit the right, bell. I'm, I'm trying to figure at out what some the stock point, is now. It, it has a retail point, store gonna, component. I don't want to release this. I, I will release it to our Discord community first, okay? Because like I want the Discord community like behind the scenes to help me research it when I'm at a level of comfort where I feel like I have a strong thesis to to discuss with Discord. It, it's a possibility. It could be a big one, guys. Like a, it's a possibility, but we're not we're not there yet. I, I hate teasing. I, I don't mean to tease well, that... tease, but like. I, no, you love to you ready. love to tease, and we have to remind people to go to dumbmoney.tv slash discord to be a part of the Discord. It is absolutely free. We never ask for money. And in fact, if anyone of uh, any of the three of us ever ask you for money, it is an imposter account. Never never send us money. Unless we're hanging out at a bar and I forgot my wallet, which is possible. If you yes, in person. <laughs> in person's the only time I'm gonna ever I'm give kidding. you money. If I'm hanging out with you, you keep, in a bar, I'm you keep tweeting me trying to uh, trying to have me like open an account with you and I don't understand. I don't need your investment advice. I can just talk to you. Um people are someone just mentioned crumble cookies. Yeah, we know crumble cookies is an insane on just on an insane run, but they're not public unless I miss something and Crumble Cookies yeah. is public now. Like they're not public, so we can't trade it. Yeah. Most of the stuff we find to, is uh, not. Think about we we are involved in a private cookie company. That, uh... <laughs> Taking forever to launch. We need to yes. we need to look at what idea. Crumble is doing and see if we can try to replicate some of that success. Yeah. Um, I don't know, guys. I still feel like there's a huge opportunity out there between now and the end of the year, besides the one I'm working on. I know there will be. I just, and by the way, I, I do want to talk about this. So I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm a speaker at the um, Traders for a Cause event next weekend in Vegas. Um, I think I'm going to go, Graham invited me to come do his show when I'm out there. So I, I might do Graham's show when I'm out in Vegas next week. Yeah, you definitely week. should. But but part my, my, so my speaking segment is trading TikTok, uh, and you know you've been watching this summer. We've been talking more and more about TikTok. It's it's everything right now, man. Like the TikTok comments, like I'm just obsessed. Like I am so confident that I'm gonna pull the next big trade is gonna come off of TikTok comments, because if there's anything trending in any meaningful way, as it's happening, you could easily extracted out of TikTok comments. It's just so easy to do. It's so easy to see what people are talking about, what they're buying, what their passion is, what they're obsessed with. And it's changing so rapidly. But I feel like I'm able to have such higher conviction because of the robustness of data that we're getting off of TikTok, because there's a billion people on it and they're super active. And the God, comments- God, you wish they had hard. TikTok comments when we were running uh, ticker tags? Dude, could you even imagine, Jordan? Could you even imagine how big ticker tags would have been if we had access to TikTok back then? Instead, we were well, focused on is, Twitter. Oh, which man, is... we should have started ticker tags like now instead of five years ago or whatever. Because now people realize the power of social media. You know what I mean? Well, the Ugh. Twitter data set was so tiny. I mean, large, but so tiny. Well, by relative... the time you filter out all the... Uh irrelevant information junk. 
<laughs> I've been yeah. meaning to ask you too it, about the ticker, the Twitter data, and if you think that more or less than seven percent of the users are bots. Uh, what have I been saying? Yeah, this is, uh, this is an easy more. one. <laughs> we always thought that their whole business model was the engagement without any regard for whether or not they're real people. It's one of those things, though. It's we never classified it by user, right? And so we don't know if the number of users, but the amount of content that we had to filter was a lot. And so it could just be that there's a small amount of users that just spray content. Yeah, which is uh, totally possible. Like well, I know I that there's that even among the real users, I think are, that um, a very that, small that, group actually contributes most of the content sure. among all the yeah. real users. I would imagine right. that the bots are more active at you know creating. So to give you an idea, there's some. Uh, traders that I follow and like whenever you click onto their comments and then at the very bottom will say show me irrelevant comments you'll hit show me and it's all like the you know the meme coiner people trying to advertise yeah. their meme and I'm sure those are bots um people want a portfolio reveal but honestly guys there's nothing in my portfolio that you probably don't already know about or that's of interest because my portfolio is just, I mean, it's just what it's just, it, it, it's a combination of companies that I've made so much money in that I cannot sell them because of the tax hit like Amazon. Like I just can't ever sell Amazon now. Right. Cause my, my entry point is $200 a share. I just, I can't sell it. Like the amount that I'm up in Amazon is almost the same as the market value of my Amazon. <laughs> you know? So it's just stuff like that. It's stuff, the stocks that we talked about, like on running and Crocs and Apple and, and spin master, um, uh, LIC obviously, but it, it's LIC has been doing well. The whole, the whole, uh, EV <clears throat> sector has had a run. Finally. I'm not like so big into LAC where it actually matters right now, but dude, LAC is down like six percent today. Is that just the market being nuts, or was there news? I I, I don't know, man. I don't yeah. know. It's I don't know. I'm not following that closely. Like I said, I'm laser focused on finding my next social arb trade. That's it. That's all I'm doing. So if like, yeah, we'll talk about the market for fun like we did on today's episode, but I don't care. I, I just, I have no clue what the hell is going to happen in the macro and the market could crash 20% or go up 10 or 15%. And I'm just not going to attempt to predict that or care about it. What I want, I want two big social arb trades between now and the end of the year. I want to do them with the community. I want us all to try to make some insane money. That Lululemon trade really just was exactly what I needed to build my social arm confidence back up that it can be done in this market. Because like, I, I honestly, I would, after on running, I was like, but is it possible that even when you're right, it doesn't even matter? Because that's kind of what I felt like after on running. And it Man, I wish we could have figured out FedEx. That would have been, oh, could you imagine if we were buying puts on FedEx? I, I have to look at my data on FedEx and see, I'm going to pull it up right now and just see if it even comes up in some of the web stats data on FedEx. And if it does, man, that, that would really piss me off. The amount of money you could have made yeah. on a move like that is absolutely incredible. Hold on, I'm pulling it right now. I mean, you'd think you'd be able to I just track- I wasn't even following the earnings calendar, so I didn't even realize they were reporting, so. FedEx is just not, yeah, it's not something I've traded a lot the last few yeah. years. Oh, dude, it's totally right there, man. Wow. Oh, this is, what this you is got? disgusting. So Similar I'm looking way? at I'm looking at I'm looking at web stats. I won't say which platform. I'm not supposed to share it, but oh, um, that's okay. Uh I it, dude, they are down. Hold on, I'm gonna tell you roughly how much here. Wow, down fifteen to seventeen percent year over year for the quarter. What, t yeah, tell How, me about um, tell me about that quarter because they actually uh, last quarter reported on the they note, beat earnings, almost. and they had they had good things to say, and then this time they missed and said, "Well, we have no idea what's going on." We're no, he guidance. said he said that it happened in the last part of the quarter. He said that like basically 
he's seen an unprecedented drop off in demand like during the last half of this quarter. Like it basically has just come up upon him. And now they're looking at cost cutting to try to, you know, readjust to the current business conditions. So he yeah. told he knows exactly what's going on. I just I just hate that they can't like th that they didn't pull guidance then and they just waited until now. I mean, if they already well, knew, that's the problem, right? I mean, these guys they don't. I mean, these guys aren't they don't have macro ec economists. And even if they did, are those macro economists any good? And are they right? Which is what their predictions are. <laughs> brings me to my point about what what he said on the Kramer show, because Kramer asked him if he thought the economy, the world economy is heading towards a recession. Those are Kramer's words. And then he responded, I'm not an economist. And then Kramer egged him on and said, you know more than an economist. Come on. They're just pushing papers. Uh, you actually look at papers. And his response was like, I, 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 I think so. Silence. I think so. Huh. But you know, these numbers, they don't portend very well. That was the, that was the quote. He didn't right. actually come out and say, I, I really am predicting a, a global recession. I'm not saying he did. All I'm saying is that he told us that the, that basically the demand has been a really sharp, fast drop off in the last part of the quarter. He, yes. And they said that in their earnings and they, they, right. they basically said that FedEx needs to cut costs dramatically. They have, they have so many problems. But um, I feel like the Kramer interview is the one that made the headlines today. And I feel like today's yeah. stock market action was purely based on headlines of FedEx sees global recession, where the reality is Kramer forced a question in a sneaky way and got someone to agree to it by, by egging them on. I wouldn't blame Kramer on the drop in the stock price or the uh, drop in the nasdaq today I guys say it's all Kramer that's today. giving him too much credit the company well, no i would say that it's not people watching mad money but if you just type in fedex uh ceo every every news story today quotes the ceo as saying that the uh, that the uh world is going into a recession but yeah. uh in fact he never said those words that was that was said for him and he just agreed to it Guys, the, you know the stock, the stock that I told you about that I'm working on for this next quarter, the social arb trade. Oh, we're we gonna find out what it like, is. No, I just, I just repulled their. I hadn't looked at their data this week. Their data for this week, it, it look. I have goosebumps, dude. I have goosebumps. Look, <laughs> dude, they are. God, it's exciting. Is it? I'm I, lo it's I love. It's a retail seeing... product. It's something that you can do a store yet. check on. You have to say is if it's retail. Or is it fashion? Retail. It is. Re yeah, it's sold in the retail world. Yes, it's sold. Okay. In, I'm not going to say whether they have their own stores or not. It's sold right. in the retail world, but it's. I, I love seeing stuff like. It, there's nothing that excites me, like seeing just an insane G trend chart or an insane web traffic chart, when you know the narrative behind the data, right? So like when there's no narrative behind the data, you're always confused. You're like, wait, did, did they just have like a big sale, right? Are they clearing out all their crap? Like, and, and by the way, there is an element of that here that I need to research further before I could really gain confidence around this. I just love what I do, man. I, I could just I could just sit in this closet and just do that. I love so much find, when you find something, when you find something, it's like, does anybody, is anybody else look at, when I traded Lulu, I was like, why the hell isn't everybody talking about this? The data on Lulu is, was so insane. It's like, how do people not see what's happening at Lululemon right now? And I, I just re-pulled the chart for Lulu and you know what? It's gotten better since earnings. Like it's just, <clears throat> it's unreal. What's happening over there? I don't know, man. I'm excited. Uh, I promise not to tease anymore. I'm going to work on this for the next few weeks, and I will release it to the community as soon as I can for their feedback. So, I can't wait. All right, what else? Do, Do you, any questions? Anyone have any questions they want to throw out? It's been a while. a lot of questions in here. Let me just filter for things that have a question mark. Um, oh, Steven, don't bring up this, the, the fire pit that we lost way. money on. 
<laughs> what? The the mirror by Lulu. Do you have a uh, thought on that? As a I could care less. I could care less device. about the mirror, Lulu. It's it's it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. I'm going to assume that that mirror will eventually be written off to zero. I could care less about it. If it ends up working, it's just like a bonus. I think it was like a stupid thing they did during the the pandemic when they were everybody thought that you know digital fitness was the next thing and you had to have a piece in it of it. Yeah, Stephen I have no thought. brought up DraftKings and he said that there is an increase in I've heard that there was a huge increase in sports betting this year. Like an like a like big. Yeah. I just don't know about DraftKings as an investment. Um, it's just, it's, it's re- what's hard, Jordan. Is, there's a and, Euro and one too, isn't there? What's the Euro one? I forgot. By the way, by the way, their web traffic is horrible relative to last year. But um, yeah, it, it, it's hmm. like, I don't know. I'm not going to say horrible, but understanding expectations for DraftKings, that's the issue, Right. DraftKings is a company, Jordan, that needs to grow meaningfully, right? Like they need to grow yeah. meaningfully. Like how much, like what are expectations of DraftKings investors? That That's a tougher nut to crack. Uh, it's easier to understand expectations with some of these other companies than it is DraftKings. Yeah. But, oh, by the way, I will mention something right now, Jordan, I want you to take a look at. So Amazon, yes, this is actually pretty important. This is pretty important. Uh, I noticed something, you know how I go through and I just pull web stats on like every pro, every company, every set, like just constantly, that's all I'm doing. I noticed something unusual with Amazon, Jordan, and it was during the month of August, aws.amazon.com web traffic is way up, like way up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's up, mm, well, 67, significantly from last year and significantly from this summer. So I'm mm-hmm. wondering what's happening at AWS. That's dry. I have no narrative with that thesis, but if I, t- if I, if I look at a Google trends chart for AWS, it's pretty it's much been like up AWS? I don't know. Um, what? Doesn't Snowflake use AWS? Yeah, so I'll look at I'll look at um oh Snowflake I think I think so. You think yeah. that's what's pushing it? Snowflake is growing right now. This is a AWS search term five years US. It's the so, it's a cloud revolution. It's the uh... but no Jordan. Here's the deal. I'm seeing the same movement in DigitalOcean. Yeah. Um. Not seeing it with stack overflow uh okay. github not seeing it with github maybe let me let me take a look at uh microsoft which would be what is it uh azure eight whatever, whatever you call it what about gitlab uh, hold on uh, let me aren't all the nerds going over to gitlab because uh github is microsoft now i don't know that's your world dude yeah. Uh, Azure, Azure, it, 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 it's up to you. Anyway, all I'm saying is, could be interesting because I have a feeling that everybody's going to get down and out on Amazon this quarter for obvious reasons. And just keep an eye on AWS because, you know, I, I can't imagine this being good for AWS, right? With what's happening globally, though, it seems like <clears throat> bad scenario. Like, I don't understand it. It seem like if, if you're if you're an enterprise client right now, aren't you kind of pulling the purse strings back on spending on tech, right? I mean, I know they've been kind of reserved for a few years, but I don't see this as the environment that people are like pushing massive amounts of money to expand their their tech and enterprise into AWS. Like I don't see that. And we know that e-com volume is down. It's not expanding, it's replacing, right? And so they're replacing on-prem with uh, cloud, right? So it's, uh, it, it, you know, you're basically, you're-, you're um... Why this month though? Why the month of August? Like why, what's yeah, I don't happening know. I mean, August I just know 22? that that part is still happening, but I don't know specifically. I mean, that could be, I don't know what it could be. 
sorry guys i know this is boring but if you want to know like what i do the 20 the 90 hours when i'm not on dumb money this is it i'm just literally looking at charts so i'm just trying yeah. to surface anomalies in speech patterns anomalies in search traffic anomalies in web traffic yeah. and when you find an anomaly then you try to figure out what the contextual because narrative what you have to is think about is like what it. is what are people going to that site for and that site is primarily an it site and so it's to either manage infrastructure or set up infrastructure or to decom infrastructure right and so um a specific mm. one month acceleration just means that there's somebody or some organization is doing a lot on aws with a lot of people yeah yeah for and sure you're basing this on some sort of a web traffic trend report web, yeah web webs yeah web traffic reports and it could that, really that... so it depends on the collection mechanism also because so the aws website is you know it's an ajax site and so you know there's a lot of information going back and forth and so it could be something as simple as the aws made a change on their front end and it's making more calls back and forth to the server you know what i mean so i don't know if that's a possibility or not by the way um crocs traffic um looks really good guys really good uh going into early september just again like normally we see web traffic with crocs spike in may and then get into a downtrend going all the way through september all the way through late october and then when we get around holiday season it starts to go up through the holidays december what happened this year is it spiked like it normally does in may and it's gone up and down, but kind of been in the same zone since then, which is wild. And if you look at web traffic for Crocs.com for the first week of September, it is at the same level as the first week of May, which is kind of wild. And guys, the reason why I'm doing this on the air is because a lot of, you know, for you're, you're watching the show, you don't have access to long-term web traffic data. It's something that I pay a lot of money for. So it's something I kind of want to share with the community because it makes me feel better about spending all the money on this software if I can at least share it with more people that can do something with it. Um, I don't want to like show the data because I don't know if I have the license to do that on the air. Um, but it is really impressive for Croc still. Uh, let's see here. Also, you kind of see a search spot. Something happened. They must have released something. I wasn't paying attention because there's also a G trend search spike that happened the first week of September. So it could have been a limited time release. I don't know. Uh, let's see what's happening at Hey Dudes. I think Hey Dudes actually has come down some, Dave, since that summer peak. Which what I'm awesome. noticing with Hey Dudes is that. Uh all of the elementary dads and i mean like a very large amount of elementary dads are wearing hey dudes <laughs> dude <laughs> yes they dads. are so I now that i know them i can spot them from a mile away i can see somebody <laughs> like 30 yards away and i'm like hey dudes dude it is the ultimate dad shoe middle america dad shoe in fact i don't even want to say middle america it's just an all over dad shoe. There's never been a bigger dad shoe than Hey Dudes. Don't say that. Now and I want to not wear them, even though they are so comfortable. I don't want to. Honestly, wear them. Dave, honestly, dad Dave, shoe. I actually find myself wearing them less because now the, the deeper I get into the culture of Hey Dudes, the more I realize I don't know if I want to represent. I don't know if I, if I like wearing them anymore. I still love the comfort, but. I'm not okay with like the culture of the Hey Dude culture. <laughs> dude, I, as an investor, I love it. I okay. love it. I love it. What is there? Is there another shoe I should be looking at? I, I'm really concerned now. Another what? You should be looking. Is at? there a new shoe, shoe that I need to look into that is comfortable but not mainstream Middle America old man? Flofers. Um, flofers. I love so I wear flumpers and toms. That's that's all I wear. I'm looking at my shoe wall. I'm like, what? Uh, Adidas basically uh, on your shoe wall. 
and some and Nike. Like, no, not mostly Nike. He's got the Air Force Ones. Yeah. But I don't know. I'll get back to you with that on Dave. Uh, Dave. All right. And does anybody want me to check while this, we're on let the just, air? Let me just any, walk the audience check web through traffic. exactly uh, how, what, what's going on in my mind right now. Because once Chris starts to go to charts, I, st I start losing interest. I'm literally setting up my new iPhone right now because I've lost interest in my own show. Hey, Dave, what did you get, say Did you get deep purple, Dave? I did. This? That's this, the most exciting. This, oh, that is gorgeous. Let, let, me, let me get some light on it. So yeah, this awesome. is the old one. This is the new one. And it, depending on the light, like it looks kind of grayish there. And then as I go this way, that looks a little more purple. And then I don't, I don't have good light in, <laughs> I have so many lights in here, but there's a blue light behind me, but it's a, it's a great color. Yeah. It's just purple enough. That's so awesome. Dave, speaking yeah. of Apple, the spike during the iPhone launch week is exactly the same as the spike during launch week last year. Just a little data for you. So I have the Interesting. charts up. Uh, Within, are you doing their, their store URL or just their homepage URL? Apple.com Apple within one, within half of 1% is the same as it was 2021. Now I also on, have- So two French bully is saying that it's the identical phone. It's not. So the 14 and the 13 are the same, but the 14 Pro has upgraded the um, so Pro. so it's identical in size and right. feel the cameras are bigger on the 14 you have Pro a bigger Max. you have a you have a bigger sensor on the stand the standard sensor it's like a 40 was it a 40 something 48 uh that's and insane. they've been they've been rocking the 12 times megapixel. the size of the sensor that's a yeah, huge for sensor. years they've been going with that 12. I think yeah. it's 12. now yeah, the front is i'm 12, pulling i'm pulling people want me to pull on running i'm pulling the data right now two-year data see how it looks the last few weeks dude it is so strong dude september is so strong for on running now it is showing a similar look to last september basically where we ramped up into september and then flatlined we're kind of seeing the same move but a little but way higher than last year so for those of y'all that want me to pull the data on on running, web traffic looks awesome uh, for the last few weeks. Awesome. Nice. In fact, w when I look at unique visitors, it actually looks even better, like shockingly good for the last few weeks for on running. Really? So honestly, I am, I am no joke. Like I know I got. I didn't lose money on on running really this quarter because I didn't play options. I just played stock and it kind of went up and came back down. I think my entry point was probably like 18 to 19, which is where it is now because I got in early enough. But like, I hope on running goes down and down and down and down going into this next earnings. Like, I'm going to wait for this thing to just get pummeled by the market because the market is just treating everybody the same. Oh, you're in retail? Oh, FedEx had a bad day today? You're, in re you're, you're down. You're, you're getting, we don't care who you are, right? Meanwhile, there are anomaly brands, anomaly, maybe five of them, maybe six or seven or eight or 10, but a few of them are publicly traded. That's what I want. I want those brands to get punished with everyone else and I want to load up into earnings. Uh, assuming that the, the trend maintains between now and then. So it's safe to say you don't own any on running on hold. So you want to hear something crazy, Dave? So I bought those on running shoes. Hold on. I haven't, I've got the box. You bought the shoes right? or the stock? No, I obviously bought the stock, but, but when I was in New York doing that store interview, I was like, I can't own this much of the company without you know really understanding the product but i made a decision i'm not even going to open it because i can return it better without opening it what does it matter if i open it it doesn't matter wait why do you have shoes okay. that you're not gonna wear i'll tell you why dude similar to similar to what happened with uh hey dudes the culture of on running 
is this like rich person's running shoe? And it just doesn't jive well with me, man. I just, I just, I feel like, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's just not me, dude. And so I can't wear them. But Jordan, what size shoe are you? Because you really like these. I showed you these. 12. When I was at the store. I think I took a picture. Yeah. I've For seen on them. running shoes. These are oh, dude, those are awesome. That's a great colorway. And and like they're not this season. They're like last year, so they're like I think they're sold out everywhere. Yeah, that colorway. So this is colorway, legit. right? I mean, maybe I will keep them because they really yeah. are cool, man. Dude, like I don't like their style, but that's the problem with my. So like my my colorway is super boring. Like I've got these gray colorways, and it's okay. But that blue is hot. Out. I'm the only Why one not in a closet not... right now without instant access to my. I'm not in my shoes. closet, dude. This is my. Uh, this is my office. I think it's. I just might. Maybe I will keep them, man. I don't know. I don't know. But we should. Uh, we should have a survey on the. If you want Chris to keep those shoes, type in "keep" in the chat box. <laughs> or if you don't want him to keep those shoes, if you think they're. Like rich, snotty old man running shoes. <laughs> they're just shoes. They, dude. They're just shoes. Uh, they're, just, they're probably the same price return. as your, uh, Adidas Keep or return uh, NMDs or whatever. <laughs> this show is spiraling. This is like what we used to do during the pandemic when we'd be on for. Like I have missed hours. doing this for so. I I, I could just keep going. <laughs> and and I have a long time to wait for my iPhone to uh, catch up. It's restoring from the cloud now. Dude, oh man! All right, some people I... think the ons are ugly. I think they're okay. I think they're unique looking for sure. They have like they have a polarizing appearance. I'm gonna pull New Balance just for kicks because I agree. New Balance has been getting rehyped <laughs> recently. They're up, man. New Balance hey, is doing about, great. Their web. What about Deckers? What do you think about the Hoka? So that that's actually a great question, dude. Because Hoka is on because Hoka's are going crazy fire. on TikTok. People dude, love Jordan. Hoka. Dude, it's it's on fire. The, I'm, I'm looking at the chart right now, freaking on fire. So here, that's was, a great. I so here's the thing. I actually looking at Deckers today, and I almost bought Deckers. Okay, so here's the deal with Deckers. You can't you can't buy Deckers based just on Hoka because I know. if Uggs are having a bad season, you'll get ripped. So right. the question is, we have remember how often we used to trade Decker with Uggs back before yeah. Hoka was a real big deal big deal? You have this magic window that happens between September and October when the interest in Uggs start to ramp up when the weather cools down. The problem is if you have a late fall, which appears to be happening right now, it looks like we're gonna have a later ish fall is that what's happening if that... i feel like it's cool right now it was cool the last two days it is heating up it's gonna be 100 oh, it's heating years. up yeah oh. yeah dude uh jordan it's a major major issue for ug sales and i mean i yeah. have made so i made so much money shorting decker when it was a late fall because yeah. there that first four to six weeks of fall, if they don't hit their numbers, it's gonna ruin they are PSL and UG season. It it completely ruins it because it's then by the time people get to the stores, they have to potentially start marking down inventory because retailers yeah. start to get nervous if they have too much inventory. It screws up their entire season. So this yeah. is one of my favorite weather trades of all time, but it's made a little bit more difficult when they have Hoka now that's a mm. meaningful brand. It moves the needle for them. Hoka is still on fire. So when you have two things happening at a company, one thing is great and one thing is not so great, it, it, it's a complicated trade is all I'm saying. Yeah. I would much rather have an awesome yeah, there's no pure play weather fall. On the Hoka. Yeah. Or no, a double. If you you know Hoka's is oh, right. on fire, yeah. and then you have a strong cold season fall when Uggs are flying off the shelves, let's because let's be honest, Deckers, for the most the part, the stock is actually. I mean, the stock is pretty strong. <laughs> this stock, okay, I, the stock, I, the stock is Deckers? strong. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 
so I have another thesis I will share on this episode. I'm glad I remembered it. I've had this thesis for a while. And I people probably are aware that people are generally there there's a movement like there's a movement again like for sober life. It's like a sober life movement, right? Where people yeah. are either not drinking or they're drinking less. They're drinking, you know, only on weekends. Uh, people are trying, there's just a general health movement. In fact, I think that TikTok is responsible for a general movement in health. In fact, uh, guys, I don't know if you know this, but I've lost 19 pounds in uh, 10 weeks. Uh, I've you been actually, intermittent fasting. Are you Thank doing you. the, the only... coffee and hot, uh, lemon or something? No, I'm intermittent fasting. I only eat once a day. I eat in a two hour window in the evening and I don't eat a single calorie. I, I have a cup of coffee in the morning, black, uh, no calories, just water. And then I eat once a day and I've lost 19 pounds. I have no hunger. I, I don't feel hungry all day. It's, I have no inflammation in my back. It's the first time in a decade. I don't have back pain. It, no, 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 like, um, like brain fog, although I had trouble getting that sentence out. No, uh, uh, what is that thing called?